What is up, everybody? Welcome back to another edition of the Sheehan Show here on Sherdog.com. My name is Sean Sheehan, and I am back with another edition of the betting show. And it's a very interesting weekend in the world of mixed martial arts, mostly on uh, my uh, my home island here as uh, Bellator bring a pretty big, interesting fun card uh, to Belfast this Friday. Uh, there's also a, a UFC card this weekend, which you know it's not it's not the best UFC card we've seen to be honest. But there is uh, a pretty good main event, uh, and I've picked out a couple of bets from that, a couple of bets from Bellator, and my fire as well from uh, from the Bellator main event. So we'll get to uh, to all of that. I wouldn't blame you if you didn't follow me this week. After last week, last week was an unmitigated disaster, the worst. <laughs> <laughs> the worst so far. I like. I. I, I went the, the two. Uh, the, the, uh, well, well, there was two t- cage warrior title fights, and then like a big contender fight. So I went for the favorite one, the underdog and the other. Bought wrong. I went, <laughs> I went for the slight underdog in the the Luke Riley fight. The Jesus wrong. I went for the under in OSB Kennedy one point five rounds wrong, and uh, Tybora the, the to evasive fight to go decision also wrong. So yeah. Four, zero for four on the the uh, picks, and zero for one. Is that how you say it? I think. And uh, I got five wrong last week. Terrible. No excuses. Um, look, we've been going pretty steady, I suppose, over the last while. We've been getting, you know, two out of four, two out of four, one out of four, not great. Three out of four, two out of four. You know, it was. This this was this was the worst week so far, and I'll be honest, we've been going okay, right? We've been going steady, but we haven't had a great week in a good while. So it's time it's time to turn it around, and hopefully, hopefully my my local expertise. <laughs> I thought I'd have that in cage already, but hopefully with that'll work. This week we'll have a we'll have a better week, and we will have. Um, <laughs> you know, some success. It's it's tough. Everyone knows. Like, uh, I know people on my side of the world. Cheltenham was on as well last week, and I actually I probably had a bit more success in Cheltenham than I did in the uh, uh, with the, uh, the the donkeys that I've had <laughs> in MMA. But anyway, we'll uh, we'll try to be- back some better ones this week and see where we can uh, take it to and see where we can uh, maybe maybe make a little bit of money and and. Um, and, and take it forward into uh into the rest of the year. So um I'm going to uh start off here with uh Bellator and um give my first two bets for Bellator, then my f- two bets for the UFC and then my uh flyer here. So let's uh let's do it that way. Right. First bet I'm going for here uh is Fabian Edwards. Um I really I, I really like Fabian Edwards in this fight against Aaron Jeffrey. Um, Fabian is uh, minus one forty to uh, to win this fight. Um, although you can uh, you can get him, you know the prices are moving. I suppose around all time. And actually, here we go. Here's something fun for everyone. Look at this. I can pull up the prices here now. Uh, so this is a this is a new thing. I'll hopefully bring on. I know people are giving out about the the graphics and the prices being on. So here we go. So Fabian Edwards um, is. Uh, the best price minus one forty, so that's the one I have taken here in his fight against Aaron Jeffrey. Um, as I said, not all the, the these uh, prop bets and stuff are up yet, but I like him in this fight against Aaron Jeffrey. Um, and I have, I suppose, I have a few reasons for it. The main part of this is when you look at Fabian Edwards's record, and you look at maybe the guys who he has fought, and the way those fights have gone. I think. <coughs> You could be fooled into thinking this is a bad matchup for him, but I don't know is it necessarily that at all, right? So he, he's lost three fights in his career. Uh, Johnny Eblen, Austin Vanderford, Casella Van Sinas. Casella Van Sinas, you know, pretty much a kind of a um, a striking matchup, uh, a split decision close one. Austin Vanderford, he did get kind of wrestled in that fight, although I thought he actually won that fight. It was a lot closer. And in the Johnny Eblen fight, he did very well. Uh, for for periods of that fight to keep it on the feet and make Johnny Ed, uh, Eblen pay one round or two uh, in that fight as well. And I think the level of wrestling Johnny Eblen has compared to most guys uh, in Bellator, I think that uh, you know would suggest that Fabian did pretty well in that realm. So, as I said, you could look at that and go, oh, his last two losses were to wrestlers, but not... Uh, that's that's a bit deceiving, right? That is a bit deceiving. And as I said, let's bit of, bring a bit of expertise to this and... and 
I think that is true. Now, that's not to say he won't get wrestled and he won't lose to uh, Aaron Jeffrey here or he won't lose to a wrestler in the future. But I do think maybe the price being a minus 140 is based on that. Like, uh, look, looking at Fabian's record here, as I said, e- Evelyn Vanderford, and then there was Musasi, Ward, Machida in the middle of that. And I, like, speaking to Fabian last week, I wonder, because you look at those results, right? He, he knocked out Machida, went to the decision with Charlie Ward uh, in, in that kind of odd fight and then beat Musasi by decision as well in one where maybe I don't think, you know, maybe maybe everyone didn't fancy him to win that fight in that way. I think if you're a Fabian and you, you're planning to fight these sort of guys, the Eblins, the Musasis, the Jeffries, you you do it in one of two ways, right? And this is this is where I found the most interest in the uh, the chat that I had with him the last way. You go out there and you try to let your hands go and you use your massive physicality, your power and all of that. Or uh, the other way, which is the way he seems to go and it has worked well for him, is you use your brain. He's a very smart fighter, a very good defensive fighter, a very good, you know, um, methodical fighter. And he does that a lot and he kind of said that to me in the interview like he said two things in the interview to me basically said he wants to be more methodical rather than just letting the hands go right which is i don't know i don't i don't necessarily agree if that's the right way to go for fabian to be honest i think i think letting the hands go is probably the way to go for fabian (coughs) and the other thing he said sorry i'm I'm still dealing with this cough but hopefully it'll be all right by next time um the other thing that he says is about his preparation, that he's preparing less outside of camp and getting into camp and preparing there more. Now, is that a good thing or a bad thing for a guy, if we if we look at it here, who made his debut all the way back in 2017, you know, fighting as an amateur since 2015, right? He's, okay, He's he's been fighting for a good while, but like... He hasn't been fighting that long exactly. He's not exactly a massive old veteran in the game who has it all learnt and you know <laughs> you know and, and he's talking more about fitness than learning, I suppose, which is not you know, not to uh, to misquote him or anything like that. Please go and listen to the interview. But I just I just wonder how that'll affect him. And the more I thought of it, when I heard it first, I was like, Oh geez, I'm not sure it was that great. But I think it might be a positive, especially considering he got knocked out in his last fight in September last year. Okay, he's had a good seven or eight months, which is a good amount of time to get past it, but I was thinking afterwards, maybe coming in fresh is what Fabian needs. And a fresh Fabian who put in a lot of work for, you know, those Van, that Vanderford fight, that Eblen fight in terms of, you know, the wrestling, in terms of the, you know, more, more the, the anti-wrestling than the wrestling, if you want to put it that way, with, with the freshness, I think it could be dangerous. Also, I don't think Aaron Jeffries... Uh, wrestling is half as good as as the likes of Evelyn or others. Uh, like you look at you look at him; he's fourteen and four. He's lost to Salter. Lost he he, be, he did beat uh Austin Vanderford, but he lost to Cabahalio back in there. But lost to Brendan Allen, Sean Brady. All good guys. There's no doubt about it. He's not he's never lost to anyone bad. You know, let's put it that way. But I feel like if Fabian can stop the takedown, which I do think he can stop the takedown, I think he can control him on the feet. And the more Jeffrey gets desperate, I think the more Fabian maybe can take over that fight and um, and win it well. You, you look at Fabian's record again, though, right? And that 12 wins and 7 finishes. Okay, it's not, not a bad percentage, but only 4 knockouts. I'm I'm honestly... I, I'm gonna, I, I think at this stage of his career... I do think Fabian needs a little bit more than that, and I too think he needs to maybe go to that uh, go to that next level. But can he do it? We will see on this one. That's bet one of the week, minus one forty for Fabian Edwards. The second bet of the week uh, is also from Bellator, and it's from one of the title fights. And I am going. I I was very torn on this fight. Um, I said it on on the preview. Um, that I'd wait until I came here to give my pick. And I actually, I kind of half gave my pick and I've, I'm going back in it. The more I think about it and the price as well. So my pick for Patricio Ferreira versus Jeremy Kennedy, betting pick anyway, is Patricio. Um, he's around plus 100. Um, if we look at the prices here, plus 101 plus minus 105, uh, plus 100 minus. So he is the underdog. 
Um, all, all, he's a favourite one best, but he's an underdog basically everywhere, and he's around that plus 100 price. Um, and here's my reasoning behind that. I, You look at the two fights he lost, right? He lost to Suzuki. It went, what, 100 seconds or a little bit more than that. He took it on a day's notice. <sighs> Is it is it fair or unfair to write that off? You know, I think looking at the Pettis fight, now he did go down away for the Pettis fight and all that, but I think looking at that is more applicable, right? So what happened in that Pettis fight? Well, Pettis was faster than him, and he was just a better striker than him, really. Um, Now he's back up in the weight. He's fighting Jeremy Kennedy. And, like, can Jeremy Kennedy beat him the same way that Pettis beat him. Can he beat him the same way that Suzuki beat him, finishing him early, you know, and uh, it's short notice and all that. I, I, no, I don't think so, right? I don't think so. Unless he takes him gr- down and ground and pounds him out of it straight away. And then, then maybe, you know, that's a, an absolute possibility. But can he beat him the same way that Pettis beat him? I don't think so, right? So you're relying on two things now. You're relying on um, Patricio... Getting older, 36 years of age now. He'll be 37 in, in, in a couple of months. And you're relying on Jeremy Kennedy being able to take it to that next level, right? Let's let's just have a quick look at Jeremy Kennedy's record. Um, 19 and 3, 10 decisions, 7 uh, knockouts, 2 submissions. So for a guy who's a big-time wrestler, not that many submissions. His record a little bit deceiving. Like he beat Pedro Carvalho. That arm peak was a shoulder injury. Very good win against Emmanuel Sanchez. Lost to the Barrocks. And before that, it was kind of, you know, guys on the way up rather than the top fighters. Okay, he fought Alexander Volkanovsky in the UFC. But you get what I mean. You know, he hasn't really been in there with that top level, apart from Beacon, apart from Carvalho, and, and you know, and Sanchez as well. He's won all of those fights, right? He's absolutely won all of those fights. But the Pico won. Not exactly, you know, not exactly. If he'd won that and stand out and knocked him out, I think there'd be a different story, but it's it's not exactly that. Now, at the same time, right, I, you, I'm, I'm not that whole, holding that against him. It's neither a positive or a negative, right? Um, the point is, has he proven he can do what he does against a competitor like, uh, you know, Patricia? Now, Pedro Carvalho is a good fighter, and he's a good test for when you're fighting Patricia next, you know. <coughs> he's a good striker, he hits hard and all, but a very, you know, a very different type of sh- uh, striker, more attacking, less maybe methodical, um, you know, you could say slightly more dangerous in areas, and you could say Patricio was, was more dangerous in more areas maybe. Um, so, there's that. Now, how does like how do Patricio fights usually go? Let's say we're looking back at Patricio from 18 months ago, two years ago. He does that, like, you know, the waiting, methodical, i use that word again, methodical style on the outside, waits for you to come in, moves around you very, very well, kind of, you know, the literal stick and move, <laughs> but, like, a defensive stick and move, and he does it extremely well. There aren't many in MMA who've done it as well as him. Like, he's a very unique, I would say, sort of sort of controlling style. And then he can land his one big shot to either knock you out or keep you guessing or to make you uh, less likely to come in and win rounds, ch- fights, championships, okay? Um, so, for Jeremy Kennedy to beat that... And I, what I'm doing here, basically, is I'm stripping away what's happened recently. I'm stripping away the, is he old? I'm stripping away, did he lose? I'm stripping away, is... You know, is it time for Kennedy? I'm stripping all that away to, to the actual nuts and bolts of the fight. Can Kennedy break that distance and come inside and take him down? That's the big question for me. <coughs> and the more I the more I think about it, I think it's going to be really tough. And then you look at that plus 100 price and go, right, if this fight was a couple of years ago, or if this fight was, how long ago was it? The, the, uh, <laughs> the, 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 the loss to Sergio Pettis. It was in June of last year. So it's like, we're not even nine months ago. I I think Patricio would probably be, what, minus 350 maybe? Minus 300? And you're giving him plus 100 now. I think that's an awful big leap for a guy who's never been beaten in that fashion. You know? So, <laughs> like, I'll, I'll just reiterate it again. The reason why I'm picking him is this. The way he's beaten by a guy like Kennedy... 
is for Kennedy to break down his defense. And it's a defense that's very, very rarely ever, if ever, being broken down in such a way by a wrestler like that. Um, could it turn? Is he older? Is it the time now? Absolutely possi- absolutely a possibility. Very much maybe, you know? And it could be. Like a lot of, if you were to come on to me here and go, Sean, I'm leaning that way, I wouldn't disagree with you. You know, and maybe I'll come on next week and go, that was a real bad pick. He was over the hill. All the analysis is right. But could this be a bit of the Parias? Could this be a bit of that? I suppose we'll wait and we will see. But I'm going, that price is just too good for me. That price is just too good for me. Patricio Ferreira plus 100. Right. The next bet I'm going for is another one that I thought was was <laughs> was just too good, to be honest. Uh, and that is, uh, that's Mick Parkin, who is fighting uh, against uh, Mohamed Usman at a... Uh, at UFC fight night, whatever it is. Uh, and uh, he is best price. Uh, I'll just put it up for you here. He is best price uh, minus one, uh, four, five. You see here at the uh, uh, at the very bottom. So, there, look, I think I think a lot of Mick Parkin, to be honest. And I, I, I'll be honest, I don't think a whole pile of, of Mohamed Usman, although I think he is proven to be better maybe than uh, a lot of people suggested or even I myself might have uh, might have suggested. I was very impressed with Mick Parkin's fight against Jamal Pogues. I thought he did very well uh, in that fight. Uh, he was good in the contender series as well. Okay, the Kaimish Shadow fight wasn't as impressive, but he still he got the unanimous decision win. Um... Uh, in, uh, in in that one, so you know he mo- moves to uh, eight no five knockouts and uh, and one uh, one submission there. The other side of it, then we have Mohamed Usman, who's ten and two. You know he went in there with Jack Collier, went to decision again, maybe a similar outing to to um, Parkins last one. He beat Taffa, wasn't the most impressive. He beat uh, Paunga. The first round of that was an extreme slap fest, and he did well in the second round. But again, maybe not as clean as you would expect from uh, a big up and coming prospect. I would say Mick Parkin's work is clean, though. Now, maybe, okay, maybe again, not the last fight. And maybe the last fight was maybe a bit too clean, maybe trying to be a bit too clean, trying to be a bit too precise. I always think, and may, maybe this is the wrong way to think, as. Uh, <coughs> you know, for up and coming heavyweights, if you want to put it that way. But I always think like the raw, uh, kind of uh, uh, attacking, athletic fighter will be beaten by the. Oh, you know, I'd say Parkins also an athletic fighter who tries to fight more tactically and technically. Like if Usman tried to fight more tactically and technically, I think it'd be a very even matchup. He. he he, it's not that maybe he doesn't, but I don't know if he can, you know? Is that just the way he is? Like, his brother is a great example of a guy who fights tactically and technically. If he could fight a little bit more like him, um, he, you know, I think it'd be a very even matchup with Parkin. But at the same time, I'll question it again, like, what's the best way to fight at heavyweight? Is the best way to fight at heavyweight the best way to fight at welterweight? Possibly not. So, you know, so maybe. But at the same time, I have to stick to that kind of core belief. I think the technical fighter will always kind of pick off the guy who's rushing in, who's trying to land that big shot. He might land one, but if he doesn't, he's going to get jabbed up. He's going to get countered. And you have to think about it as well, right? So Mick Parkin trains with uh, that unbelievable team of heavyweights in the UK at the moment with the likes of Philip De Vries, who's the KSW champion, obviously the UFC interim champion uh, in uh, in uh, Tom uh, Aspinall as well, uh, along with a few more. And like... What's Usman going to bring that need that the two of those lads are not going to bring? Like you have the athleticism and the power of Aspinall, who I'm sure you know <laughs> it, it, it'd be hard probably to pick a guy in the world who could maybe emulate Usman better than maybe an Aspinall could. You know, very not not a similar type of fighter at all, to be honest. But he a very similarly athletic type of fighter who can move in the way Usman would move, and then. You know, you have the big guy, the freeze, who can get on top of you and make it tough for you against the cage. You know, the preparation couldn't be better. And I think that would be a big part of it as well for Parkin. Uh, I think that's a massive advantage for him. And I think, uh, like, the biggest issue with someone like Usman is you get in there and you've never faced 
anything like him before and it's a shock to the system. I don't think that will be a shock to the system for Barkin at all. I think quite the opposite. I think it'll be something he's well used to. So I think he's a better fighter. I think the one, the, the biggest downfall of him maybe not expecting it is, is or not being used to it, is not as much of a drawback as it would be for most people. And at minus 145, I think that's an absolutely... Uh, absolutely fantastic price, so I am going to uh, I'm going to go for that as my uh, third bet of the week. Right, my fourth bet of the week uh, is is a bit of an an interesting one. I am going for even though she even though she doesn't have too many of them in her career, I'm going for Rose Namunas to win by decision at plus two sixty. Um, let's just have a a quick look at. Both Rosnam Yunus and Amanda Hebas's records for a second. Um, 12 and 4 for Hebas. Uh, her wins are spread 3, 4, and 5 between knockout submissions and decisions. Her losses, 3 knockouts and 1 decision for Tog Rose. At the other side of 11 and 6, which is mad considering how good of a fighter she is, spread again 2 knockouts, 5 submissions. Four decisions, uh, one, one, and one in terms of knockouts, submissions, and decisions uh, in losses. Um, and I think the big part of that is you okay, you look at Hebas again, right? And you look at her, um, uh, you look at the way her losses have been spread. I suppose she has got knocked out a few times over the last while. Nam Yunus on the other side of it, then like she knocked out Zhang Weili with that head kick, uh, in 2000 and in, in 2021. You know, it's 2017, the Yuani and Jacek fight before that. That's seven years, and she's only had one knockout in seven years. The submission side of it, then, like, is it? It's Michelle Watterson's last one she submitted in two thousand and seventeen. <sighs> Do you see what I'm getting at? <coughs> is she going to submit her? Is she going to knock her out? Like, probably not, right? Probably, probably not. Now. Okay, Hebas has gotten finished, as I said, a few times. She's only lost once by decision. But I've, I've kind of gone backwards in this. I've kind of looked at the end before I looked at uh, the middle and, and the, uh, the application. Um, but if you just look at the end, I do think, I do think Nami Yunus is going to be more, um, I suppose... Uh, not slow is not the right word, but method- methodical. I use that word again. Like you look at her, you look at her. I, I, I might as well pull up all I can. Her last few fights, right? Forget about the result. Decision, decision, decision. We had that head kick. Decision, uh, knockout. Decision. That's all the way back until that Ian Jacek fight that we're talking about. So mostly decisions over the last while, whether winning or losing. Now you look at this fight, right? So let's get to the the brass tacks of it. And there, I actually don't have that much analysis of it, apart from this. I think Rose Namuse is a better fighter. I think, um, I, I, let me just check the, the that flyweight, yeah. I think at, at flyweight, I, I, I'm actually really not sure why Rose Namuse is at flyweight, to be honest. But I think Hebas is one of the smaller flyweights, obviously. She's fought down at 115 as well. I think it's it's not a big an issue as fighting Manon Firo. Uh, or others up at that weight class, or if she was fighting, you know, Shevchenko or whoever it might be. Um, I think that's less of an issue for her here, and I think she she's just a better fighter. I think she's a very good um, long fighter, very good at landing that jab. We know what Hebas is like. You know, when Hebas gets into her rhythm, when she starts landing her shots, landing her combinations, putting you in places you don't want to be, she's very good. I feel I feel like. You know, in, in, she, here here's an, an analogy for you. There was this uh, soccer player before Nicholas Anelka, right? And he was a great goal scorer. But he'd score, you know, if he scored twenty goals in a season, he'd score fourteen goals in about ten games. Wouldn't score for another twenty games, and then he'd score six goals in three games or something at the end of the season. You know, he's one of those guys. I think he is a little bit like that as well. V- either very good, blows are very very hot, or blows a bit cold. Now. If if you are that sort of fighter against a controlling type of fighter like Rose Namunas who fights who can fight and does fight long an awful lot of the time, I think that can be a surefire way to take you from hot to cold. 
I think if Hebas has a tough first round, second round, you know, you go three, four, and five, and the, the level of control that she will have to take back from Nami Yunus will be massive. I think if Nami Yunus gets that, she like she's the ultimate, I think, rhythm fighter. If she's winning, she will continue to win. And I think she will. I think she will. I think she is going to realize that she is a better all round fighter than Hebas early enough in the fight. I think she's going to pick her off. I think she's going to be happy picking her off. We know we, we know what way Nami Yunus kind of looks at the sport as well. And, you know, with Pat Barry there in the corner, they're looking for they're looking for perfection rather than a finish. They're looking for I don't get hit. I pick her off here, 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 and here. You know, they were after the Asparza fight and they were like, "Look, we didn't really get hit in that fight, and I touched her up a lot of times." But that's perfect. And everyone else is like, "Oh, that's so boring and all." That's kind of what I think she needs to do against Hebas. But Hebas won't stand back like Asparza did and make it a boring fight. She'll actually come forward and she'll try to land, but I don't think that will work well for her. Now, do I think that'll get her finished? Probably not. Um, so that's why I'm going for the decision. And I think that price is really, really, really good uh, to uh, to win the decision there um, at, uh, at plus 240. Let me just pull up uh, some of the other uh, prices on that. Um, the... He has his plus two hundred best price, minus two ten best price for uh, for Rose, um, and I'll just pull, show you the price here of Rose to win by decision. Uh, plus t- actually plus two sixty now, uh, best price at the moment. So that price has gone up again. So plus two sixty uh, at the moment here for that one. We pull up more of the prices here again on that uh, in a second. So yeah, plus two sixty Nam Yunus uh, by decision. I uh, I mean, actually that's the that's the price I did add for some reason. I thought it was plus two forty. Okay, Nam Yunus by decision. Bet number four, and for the flyer of the week, I was I was looking at this price yesterday, and uh, it was plus three hundred, uh, and it had only just come out, and the price has now moved to plus three sixty. So I think that's big enough for a flyer, and that bet is uh, a straight up Carl Moore to be Corey Anderson. Uh, in the main event at Bellator Belfast, you see here best price plus three sixty. Another place is plus three fifty, plus three twenty. Oh, uh, you know, um, all over the plus three hundred mark there. So I think that's uh, big enough right now to give you as the uh, uh, as the flyer of the week. Um, I look, you give me a straight up pick in this fight, and I'm probably picking Corey Anderson, right? But I think that price is is way too way too wide, and I'll give you. I'll give you a couple of reasons why, right? Um, let's just pull up Carl Moore's record here. 12 and 2, 5 submissions, 2 knockouts, 5 decisions. His last few fights. I, I did a video on this a while back, and I spoke about how maybe it's misunderstood how how good these wins have been. He fought Carl L. Brexton after coming back three years out, 2019, he fought in that card in 2022 when he came back. And it's hard to know what he was going to look like when he came back. Carla Brexton was ranked at the time, beat him, went in and fought Magic Krasansky, who a lot of people didn't know. But Magic Krasansky had actually beaten Will Flory during the pandemic, a very good fighter, beat him, and then beat Alex Polizzi, who I believe was ranked number seven at the time, and beat him fairly well. So he's beaten two ranked guys, and like a guy who probably should be ranked, but a lot of people maybe don't know him. Like, there's very few at uh, the, the, the middle head, light heavyweight, heavyweight division, especially in Bellator, who are beating guys, who are two ranked guys and another guy who should probably should be ranked. That happens very, very, very rarely. In fact, it happens very rarely in most divisions. But for Carl Moore to do that, after having been out for three years, I thought that was a very, very, very big thing and maybe went a little bit too unnoticed. Now, obviously, I'm Irish, and I've, you know, I've, I've seen him up close personal for years and years and years. Uh, so maybe I'm looking at it a little bit closer. Sir, but that's you know that's my job too that's why i'm here um and it was true it was all true and i think bellator have realized that and everyone re- has realized that and that's why he's uh, rightfully gotten this spot um now having said that that doesn't mean he's going to win the fight or that doesn't mean he's as good as Corey anderson or anything like that um you look at Corey over the last while, you know, he's had a bit of a a bit of a back and forth time beat Phil Davis by split decision, as everyone does. Lost to Nimkov. We had that no contest. And he did a great run in his three fights when he came into Bellator, you know, beating Bayadar, Yashmidordov, and uh, and Melvin Manhoof uh, as well. Um This fight I think comes down to a few things. 
the first and almost biggest thing is the crowd. How how big of a difference is the crowd going to play? The crowd's going to be insane. Let me tell you that. Um, I think the way the card is uh, set out is going to help as well. If you uh, if you uh, uh, if you look at it here, Corey Anderson, Carl Moore is the main event. The two fights under that. No Irishman in, in the co-main event, Patricio against Jeremy Kennedy. No Irishman in Fabian versus Aaron Jeffrey. And then we have James Gallagher before that. Sorry, let's say James Gallagher wins or loses. If he wins, he'd be absolutely mad. If he loses, okay, the crowd will be down a bit. But they'll have an hour to recover there before they get to the main event. And I think that is absolutely massive. A big issue with a lot of the Irish cards lately is, you know, there's been a big loss maybe in the co-main event. And the main event, you know, a Queely walking out or whoever it might have been, it was a little bit damper than it would normally have been. I don't think that'll be the case here. So that, I think, is a massive advantage, first off, for Carl Moore. Maybe something you wouldn't think of normally as well, right? Um, I think that's huge and going to get him through, uh, you know, get him through bad times here if, if that happen. I think the other things, right, which are massive, are obviously more fight best. Can, like, first of all, what is Corey Anderson going to do? I think a lot of people, and I don't know if I agree with it, think Corey Anderson's just going to come out, try to wrestle Carl Moore, get him to the ground. Now, first of all, maybe he will. Uh, second of all, Carl Moore's actually very good on the ground. He's very good submissions. You know, like, he, okay, he doesn't have a lot of submission wins. Well, his five submission wins, I suppose, out of twelve, which is pretty good. Uh, you know, he 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 submitted Carl Brexton. He submitted uh, lads back in the day. You know, Cyril Lasker, who was in the UFC, and uh, and others as well. A lot of uh, uh, a lot of cage warrior submissions there uh, when he was going to, to win the cage warriors light heavyweight title, which a lot of people forget as well. But um, so that's something to worry about. If he does take him down, now the other side of it, will he take him down? I feel like he, I, I feel like he won't initially, right? Um, I think Corey Anderson is going to come out here and try to strike with Carl Moore having a normal um, mixed martial arts match. I don't think he wants to necessarily turn this into a wrestling match. If the takedown opens itself up and it's available, will he go for it? Absolutely, no doubt about it. But I don't think he's going to be. You know, coming out doing a habib in it. Let's put it that way. So I think the, that gives Carl Moore. Um, I I think that gives Carl Moore something to maybe try to get an advantage from. Whether it is landing a big shot, you know, he's very powerful. He's a massive man. He's fought at heavyweight before. You know, Anderson's not a heavyweight. I think you know, could he make a middleweight? Or he probably could. Like, um, so that power, that size, is something he could use. I think in that fight, um, the other like, I I, I may sound like I'm I'm clutching the straws or picking ways for him to win but like at the higher weight classes I think those are legitimate ways to win right can he land a big shot can he land himself a takedown can he get on top because when he gets on top he is an absolute demon on top and then there have been fights recently where you're thinking maybe okay is he going to get taken down and he's the one who gets on top and he dominates there you have to remember as well, he has some really good training. He's Johnny, you know, Johnny Walker's one of his main training partners. I mentioned Will Fury earlier on, one of his main training partners as well. He's two, those are his two main training partners. He's very good training, which is unusual, I suppose, for a guy in this side of the world uh, at light heavyweight to have. A little bit like Mick Parkin I mentioned earlier as well. So there's a lot, there's a lot of things going for Carl Moore. That's, that's kind of what I'm going here. Why, why am I picking him as the flyer? Because there's a lot of things going for him. He's the crowd. <coughs> Great training. He's another thing as well, people forget. He's been there and done that. Like, he's won a, a cage where he's light heavyweight title. He's been out for a long time. He's had to struggle. He's felt that struggle, which a lot of people maybe haven't. And he's reached, and I think he's reached at a time, you know, he made his debut all the way back in 2011. He was fighting as an amateur in 2010. He's been at this for 14 years. This isn't a guy, a new guy who's, you know, won a few fights and all he's getting a title shot because he's Irish. Absolutely not. This guy has earned it. Absolutely earned it. And it's it's good timing for him. In a good place. And um, I think that plus 360 is too big. I, I think it should have been maybe plus 200 or something like maybe plus 250. But a plus 360, that's my flyer of the week. There you go. Right. Let's run through some of uh, some of the other odds here. And I'll uh, I'll take you on a, on a journey here and we look at them. Um, as I said, this, the straight up price is there for, uh, for Anderson and Moore. None of the uh, the prop bets are up yet. Unfortunately, I waited as long as I could to uh, uh, to record that. 
Nick Kelly, Jordan Elliott, the amateur fight. Nick Kelly's massive favorite there. Uh, I, I, like he will win it almost certainly, but like you never know at the amateurs. So that plus three twenty five might be looking good next week. Uh, Kennedy Fahey, obviously we've talked about that as we have with um, Jeffrey and Edwards. I'm really torn, lads, on um, on James Gallagher versus the Andrew Higo. Gallagher did open as a favorite, I believe. Let me just. Um, let me just check here if you can see this. He did, yeah. So he's gone from minus 110 to plus uh, 103 or plus 110 in some places. He is the underdog now. I think I think that is mm, fair. I think that's correct. I think Galler should probably be the underdog, but in a very, very close fight. Um, who's the pick there? Like, I, I, I hate to say it. I hate to go against my countrymen, but I think he got still at that price is the pick. If it goes out to minus 175, maybe, I'd maybe be turning around, but at that price, I still think it has to be Higo. Um, Suzanne Wild, I haven't seen a whole lot of Suza, to be honest, but if he's that price against Wild, he must be good. Do you know one price I love? I absolutely love it. Plus 140 for a Luke Trainer uh, in, in that fight there. Really like that price against Grant Neal. Um... Again, after that, not a whole lot. Uh, Alfie Davis has uh, um, a short notice replacement. I think Nathan Kelly at a massive price, minus 1,000, is going to uh, to win that one. Let's jump over to the UFC then. Uh, the straight-up prices. Uh, Hebas, best price, plus 200, minus 210 for Nami Yunus. I do like the minus 210 Nami Yunus, to be honest. Uh, and there isn't a whole lot more. On uh, on that card, Justin Taffa plus one sixty against Carl Williams minus one ninety. Uh, you know, I I don't know. Give give me Taffa at the plus money uh, in that. Do we have uh, do we have the under uh, under a round and a half plus one thirty five? Give me that under. Give me that under all day long. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Dobson and Shabazian. <sighs> Shabazian, you know, uh, the biggest. What's the biggest price there? Minus two one five. Uh, I I wouldn't trust Shabazzi in my life to be honest. No way. Give me uh, give me Dobson in that fight. Uh, fight best play, best price plus one seventy. Simon and Talbot. Um, I think Simon at plus one twenty five might be a good price there. Talbot is a good fighter, all right. But Simon, I think because he lost his last fight, maybe a little bit underrated. So I'll uh, I'll throw him in there. Billy Q taking this. Was he's on chart notice? Or maybe it's his opponent on chart notice. Uh, I do like him against Alal. Best price minus one thirty. And uh, after that, not not a whole lot. Kurt Halibaugh is the underdog in his fight against Triogden. I like uh, I like Junior Ross actually plus one two three in that fight. That's pretty good. There's a couple more in the UFC as well here. Um, uh, those people, if you want to look at those prices on screen, but the the Parker one is the big one that I'm looking at there minus uh, one four eight to win his fight over there. So yeah, that's all the betting for the, the weekend. I hope you enjoyed it. Let me know if you enjoyed the graphics and the pulling stuff up there. Hopefully you did, and hopefully we'll uh, we'll keep it going every week, and uh, we'll uh, uh, we'll 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 go again, and we can get uh, we can keep getting better. So let's uh, recap the bets for the week. Fabian Edwards minus one forty, bet one, bet two, Patricia Fahey plus one hundred, minus one four five for Mick Park, and I'm going plus two sixty for Rosnam Yunus to win the decision in the main event, and in the main event in Bellator, the Flyer of the Week plus three sixty, Carl Moore straight up to win against Corey Anderson. All right, everyone. Thank you very much for tuning in. My name is Sean Sheehan for SureDog.com. Please bet responsibly, and we'll see you all next time.